and it's going live. Right, well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, Temple Bar Trust talk where we are going to be talking about towards a new vernacular in the age of climate emergency with Julia Barfield. Um, and the hint of what she might be talking about was, in, I think, in the background of some of the publicity that uh, uh, we had with the Sterling Prize uh, nominated at Cambridge Mosque in the background, which is a, a, a sort of new new approach uh, from the practice who, if uh, one thinks of, I've always thought of Barbara Mark, slightly in the high-tech uh, end of the spectrum, particularly, I guess, with the uh, uh, London Eye and, of course, uh, the 360 down at Brighton. But before I hand uh, you over to Julia, I'd just say uh, that I'm uh, Peter Murray. I'm chairman of the Temple Bar Trust. And for those of you who haven't been uh, uh, watching these Zoom events before uh, the Temple Bar Trust is taking over Temple Bar in Paternoster Square and bringing it back into civic use and as the home of the Worshipful Company of Chartered Architects. And we are about to sign a lease any day now. We thought it was last week, but the lawyers are still um, doing their searches and so on. So hopefully the next few days or uh, maybe sometime next week, uh, we will have a, a lease, we'll be um, using the word. Um, could, could the person who is having a party and isn't on uh, turn their sound off, that would be great for this. Looks like that's stopped. Thank you. Um, and so uh, we are about to take over the building and we'll be using it for educational purposes. Uh, for meetings and for um, dinings and meetings together and the Sir Christopher Wren Dining Club we'll be able to meet there and have discussions about uh, issues to do with architecture and it is branded as the architectural gateway to the City of London so uh, we hope uh, everyone will be able to enjoy the building shortly we'll be doing some works on it in the new year and then uh, open probably sometime uh, in, in the spring. So we'll keep you up to date with that. But that's the background for these talks, which, of course, um, we started doing at the beginning of lockdown when we realised that we weren't going to be able to move into Temple Bar uh, when uh, COVID hit us. So now we are uh, hopefully getting back and doing these things in person. But it's very useful to be able to still communicate uh, via Zoom because we can get a, a, a wider group of people in the audience and we can record everything and people who weren't able to make it tonight will be able to watch it uh, at their leisure. So that's uh, all I want to say about the Temple Bar itself and I'm, now I'm going to hand you over to Julia. Look forward to hearing what you have to say, Julia. Thank, thank you very much, Peter. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, hopefully this will will work. Can you see that? Yes. Excellent, excellent. So I'm just going to um, uh, start by saying the plan is to do a brief introduction to Mark Barfield, followed by a bit about the climate emergency and we, how we as architects should respond, finishing with a bit of more detailed description of a couple of our recent projects. So I founded Mark Sparfield um, Architects with my partner, David Marks, more than 35 years ago. Our project portfolio is unusually diverse across many sectors, culture, education, infrastructure, leisure, workplace, public realm, and more recently, the sacred. And it also, as, as Peter says, includes some self-generated projects like the London Eye and Brighton Eye 360, where we made the leap to become entrepreneurs as well as architects. We've been told that our work is difficult to categorize, um, which I relish, actually. We don't have a house style. We, Because we've kept the practice relatively small, we don't have a huge portfolio of completed projects. Each project gets a huge amount of attention and is unique, coming as it does from a thorough understanding of the client's needs, aspirations, the site, its context, its history, and broader social and environmental imperatives. I mean, in a way, it would be strange to us if each project was not very different. 
We're about 15 strong. We operate from a studio in Clapham. Well, we are. We're sort of semi back now after the um, after COVID, um, and we have a 50/50 gender balance, which isn't wasn't difficult. Um, and um, we've we've um, you know always tried to maintain a technical edge and a social conscience. Indeed, this is something that David and I wrote in the early days. I think someone must have asked us what our definition of design was. Um, and this was sort of our answer, and it's really guided us through 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 the years. For us, design is a powerful tool for good, both social and environmental, and at its best, it improves the quality of people's lives and lifts their spirits, while drawing on a minimum of the earth's minimum resources, or earth's limited resources. We've always um, integrating sustainability into our projects from the very start, using passive design principles orientation, maximizing natural light, ventilation, minimizing en operational energy use, etc. And these are just a few of our kind of early projects. I'm not going to talk to them in any detail, but it's just, you know, they were very much about minimizing operational energy and responding to the site. And, um, and you know, this, this is actually a, pr a project in Lincoln where we put in a ground source heat pump, and that was in 2009. So, um, we were trying to do some quite innovative things on the on the um, sustainability side, um, but um, you know we also enjoy working very much with um, with engineers. Um, our ethos is very much to in involve engineers from the early stages, so that the design emerges from the way a building works, not simply simply from the way it looks. And this is our project in. Brighton I360. So coming to the climate crisis. Now, COVID has been disruptive, but it's also been a great accelerator in terms of our digital connectedness. And um, it's, it's no doubt going to be financially difficult as well, but it all pales into insignificance compared to the global impact of the climate and environmental emergency. And indeed, the climate emergency has become visible this summer all over the world. Um, and with floods in Germany, fires in Greece and, um, and Cyprus, and indeed the, um, the heat dome over North America. And what I find most scary about that is that it seemed to be, seems to be progressing even faster than scientists had predicted. I think that, that surprised even them. I mean, what woke me up to the climate emergent urgency of the climate situation was when I read the IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, report in October 2018, when the world's top scientists were warned that we have 12 years to limit climate and environmental catastrophe. And um, you know their most recent report in August this year issued a code red alarm for the world. And um, it's saying that our carbon, carbon budget gives the best odds of staying within 1.5, and it runs out in five years at current emission rates. And now, post COP26, we can understand where we are, following all the promises and targets of the of, of the last of the last few weeks and the policy agreements. And we can see from this um, that the uh, ambition gap between where we need to be and where we are is still huge. Um, and and this, I think, is one of the most clear. Uh, temperature graphics that I've seen. Um, I mean, in my opinion, it should be on every front page at the end of COP, because this is the reality. We are on. We were on track to reach um, 2.7 degrees by um, 2100, but now we're on track to reach 2.4, which, in relative terms, is better after COP, but it's nowhere near where we need to be. I mean, it seems there's an extraordinary mismatch between the science and the politics and between the science and mainstream media. I mean, if you have a small voice in the back of your head telling you it's going to be all right because governments have got this, this is the evidence that they really haven't. I mean, I think cities are further ahead than governments, having said that, and, and with the C40 chaired by Sadiq Khan, I think that's, that is a good thing. But I believe we all have to listen to the science and act both professionally, personally, and politically. It's obviously the most important issue of our time. And given that cons the construction sector contributes disproportionately to the problem, 40% of CO2 emissions in the UK, it's a, in, in, beholden on us to um, contribute to solving it. 
and we're creative problem solvers after all. I mean, I joined with a number of um, other architects, Steve Tompkins and Martin Paul in particular, um, and we set up Architects Declare in May 2019. And it was based around these 11 pledges, which each practice signed up to. It's about raising awareness, abdicating faster change towards regenerative design practices, reducing carbon waste and sharing knowledge. And then we've also added this 12th um, uh, declaration point, which is uh, very important to do with climate justice. And, you know, the, the um, organization has spread way beyond our expectations, first to other disciplines, and in, it's actually gone global um, with in more than, I think, 28 countries with uh, 7,000 practices signed up. So we recognize um, that change needs to happen at a system level, and we're trying to change mindsets. And we had the, um, and so we've uh, organized a number of events. Um, this was one of our first one, and we had the amazing Kate Rayworth talk at the event. And she, with her donut ep economics, has imagined a whole new economic paradigm with humanity and social justice at its core, and that stays within planetary limits. And this quote, I think, is 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 really good because you know, it recognizes that we have an economy that needs to grow, whether or not it makes us thrive, and clearly it doesn't. Um, what we need is an economy that makes us thrive, whether or not we grow. And we need to start questioning um, the, the thinking, the fundamental assumptions that have got us into this mess. For instance, GDP, um, as which is a measure of, of, of success that's ubiquitous, but how can it possibly make sense to champion infinite growth on a finite planet, particularly one in such a fine, in, in such a fragile state? But what gives me hope is that there's huge energy around this issue in the construction industry, especially among young architects and engineers. I mean, we collaborate with other grassroots, uh, voluntary grassroots groups. Um, that notably the ACAN and Letty, who are, who are amazing. And more recently, we've collaborated with the RIBA with the recent pre-COP climate summit that was done jointly um, with um, AD and the RIBA. And next week, we launch our practice guide, which we've designed to help practices meet their declaration points, which is, um, which is going to be launched next week. And I've just put this kind of classic, quite an old cartoon up because it's a gentle reminder that if we respond to the climate crisis in the right way, it's not all hair shirt. It's not really something to be um, worried about in, 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 in the global north. It's actually going to make a lot of people's lives better. I mean, I've personally changed so many of my personal choices around what I buy, how I what I eat, how I travel. I mean, I don't intend to fly for pleasure again, but for example, but I have no intention of letting it curb my wanderlust. And I'm healthier, healthier as a result as well. I walk and cycle a lot more and eat better. And of course, the air will be a lot cleaner. This was Delhi um, with and without the pollution um, before and after a lockdown. Um, and, uh, and I heard that three times more people died of pollution during COVID than died of COVID. So what do we need to do as architects? And I think there's a lot we can do. I mean, I've identified nine points. I'm sure there's many more than that, but I'll go through them one at a time. We need to become more carbon literate. There's that's no doubt about that. Um, we at uh, Marks Barfield have, with our weekly C CPDs, have really had a whole series of CPDs and they're mostly focused on um, new, material, new biomaterials and becoming climate literate. Um, we've done our own carbon footprint um, of all of the um, office um, activities, but also we need to recognize that, relatively speaking, our office footprint is very small compared to the projects that we do and compared to the um, personal uh, carbon footprints of, the, of people in the practice. But the main thing has, is the projects. We need to drive down and regulate embodied carbon. I mean, one of the ways the climate emergency changes our definition of sustainable architecture is the consideration of embodied carbon. So those early projects that I showed you were all about um, in-use carbon. Um, and but now we need we now we know that embodied carbon is um, you know probably more important. Um, 
as it's, you know, and you're by embodied carbon, I've been mean, assuming that most people who are at this lecture understand that it's about the extraction of materials, manufacture, transportation and construction. And the point um, is that carbon is spent up front and it accounts for 25, 75% of a typical building's carbon. And we need to calculate the whole life carbon of our buildings. And it's good that the GLA is starting to insist on that as well. I mean, we've we've done we've started to do that on on our buildings. We've done a, a carbon assessment, for instance, of our mosque, um, and this was um, assuming that um, that we have sequestration in the timber. Um, and it but it shows up interesting things like the steel reinforcement was much higher than than we had, had we had originally thought. Um, we were also worried because we had an Irish contractor and uh, they flew back and forth to Northern Ireland and that but that actually wasn't as big a portion as we had expected. We also need to move to a circular and more regenerative mindset away from the linear make, use, dispose um, uh, um, to take into account um, the, the, the to, to actually use less materials. We need to be have adapted reuse of existing buildings, the whole retrofit campaign. Um, and as Duncan Baker Brown calls it, we need to make sure that we mine the Anthropocene. You know, the, the, there's lots of material already out there. We shouldn't really be um, uh, bringing in more, more material. There's so much there already. I mean, this is an example of a project that we've done a couple of years ago, which is um, a retrofit project where we joined uh, three buildings to make one and then created a new atrium in, in the middle of it uh, and and restored um, an, an existing building that was very tired to a new office space. This is uh, an example of um, reusing materials in a slightly um, more creative way, um, using actually parts of, of buildings um, in um, to make a new facade. We also need to design buildings for radical adapt adapt adaptability and disassembly. Uh, we need to, um, this is an example of a building that was um, constructed on the South Bank. It was a, um, it was a water seagull building that was disassembled and, and then reconfigured, um, not by us, but a fourth year students, um, and, and then rebuilt on a site um, in Stockwell. Um, and it, you know, it was bolted together. That's how it was able to, um, to 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 do this. So we need to use much less glue, foam, and chemical products derived from fossil fuels. We also need to move to more plant-based biomaterials and sustainable products. You know, for instance, and there's so much innovation going on about um, in discovering these new materials from all kinds of weird and wonderful things uh, like algae and uh, mycelium and um, 3D printed clay um, and of course there's hempcrete that we that is carbon negative that we need to um, start using as well as new use new modern contemporary ways of using um, traditional materials like thatch or straw bales um, or rammed earth or indeed mycelium um, all of these things need to be considered, or indeed um, stone. Uh, we need to really just think about the materials that we use much more carefully. We also need to build less. Um, I like the story of some engineers who were asked to design a new car park for Heathrow because there were peaks in demand that couldn't be accommodated in their current car parks. But a bright spark decided to ask a few questions and find out that the peaks coincided with flights from India, where it's the custom for the whole family to go and to meet a returning member in multiple cars. So they simply suggested the solution to the problem was to spread out the flights from India, eliminating the need for the new car park. Uh, so we need to kind of think differently, really, and, and really think carefully before we agree to any projects. We also need to what I term join the movement. Um, I went to see a lecture by the wonderful 
Bill McGibbon, the um, famous American environmentalist. And at the end of the lecture, somebody asked him, what can I do as an individual? And he just turned around and said, don't be one. Um, you know, join a movement. And, and and I actually think it's our duty as citizens to make our voices heard. Because as I said earlier, we can't rely on government to do it for us. So if though all those plant-based and biomaterials put you in mind of vernacular architecture, it's no coincidence because it seems to me that we um, mm. um, might be moving towards a more, a, a new vernacular, at least a simpler form of architecture in response to the existential threat that we face. This is my attempt at a, a definition because it's um, an architecture that's more local, regional, using traditional materials, resources and technology from, from that area. And, and I don't necessarily mean really local. I mean, it depends what you define as local. Is it 25 miles or is it Europe? Or it depends how you define it. But we need to use materials more efficiently that are more easily maintained with no waste. And I also think architecture should be influenced by its context, its graphical and its culture. This is one of the aspects of um, vernacular architecture. So we don't just get um, kind of repeat of, you know, an a building that could be anywhere in the world. Um, I think it, it becomes reaffirming to reaffirm the kind of identity of a city, for example to think about something that's unique about that. And also, um, I think it's, 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 it's about learning from the past, but always looking to the future, not in a nostalgic way. It has nothing to do with style, um, but maybe we can find an architecture that discovers new ways of embracing global knowledge, technology, and connectedness to create a local and contextual um, architecture that's unique to its place, a simpler form of architecture, if you like. And I'm just going to describe now two projects that we worked on um, recently. So this is us trying to put those principles that I described into practice. It was a competition for school building that we did in December last year with Webb Yates and, and Richie Daffin. And these are the principles that we tried to Im embed in, in the design and led the design was um, long life, whole life carbon, um, net zero, drive, driving down the embodied carbon, but also being globally connected and digitally rich, um, robust, low maintenance materials, locally sourced, non-toxic materials, uh, fabric first. We had our, our walls were ultra thick. They were um, six to 700 um, uh, millimeters thick and um, being in mind of future flexibility and adaptability and um, with no waste and designing also hopefully to lift the spirit and using recycling, reuse of materials, which I'll exp explain later. So this was, um, we, we, we determined the whole section of the building from its orientation, but also from maximizing natural light and ventilation. And then we, um, we looked at what the material should be. So we um, were thinking about using a local stone, um, reused bricks from the, uh, the old buildings that were going to be demolished, uh, timber, using skull, not using any concrete at all, using uh, screw piles and stone slabs in, in, in the, and, and, and timber in the, in the base. And um, these uh, and hempcrete um, and um, plunge, which was the local stone. And this, we did a, 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 an analysis of the buildings that were going to be demolished. And um, because they were um, very early buildings, they were just in the end of the um, 19th century, we assumed that they had lime water so they could be taken apart. And we did a calculation of how many bricks that we would need and how many bricks that we had. And we realized that we did have enough to, to um, to reuse them. And then we did this um, life, cycle, life cycle carbon analysis, which is over the supposed lifetime of the building, which is generally about 60 years. And it started at negative, and even over 60 years, we were only at um, 693 tonnes compared to you know, a normal concrete frame building, which would be over 3,000. How am I doing for time? Um, I'm going to now talk a bit about the Cambridge Central Mosque. Um, 
which is actually a project that we started um, more than 10 years ago. Um, this, I like this slide because it really defines the, the need for the, for the mosque. Uh, the, um, the current mosque was, was over, um, oversubscribed. Um, but of course, um, we hadn't done a mosque before. So we did um, research um, to find out about the history of mosques and, um, and the, the mosques throughout the world. Uh, and we discovered that um, they adapted to their local cultural and climatic conditions. Really, that's a local vernacular, if you like. So we kind of asked ourselves, so a mosque in you know, northern the Sahara looked very different from a mosque in China, looked very different from a mosque in India. Um, so we asked ourselves, what should a British mosque designed in the 20th century be like? And we studied the British sacred tradition. Obviously, this on the right hand side, that's the, um, the local, the King's uh, College Chapel in, um, in Cambridge. And actually, it's King's College Chapel on the, on the left as well. And we looked at the Islamic sacred tradition as well. This is just a sample of, of mosques that we looked at. But we didn't want to, we developed a, a concept. We didn't want to create a replica or a pastiche, but we wanted to bring together the true, tr two traditions to create a mosque that was unique, unique to its place and time and where modernity and innovation met, met, met timeless sacred principles using the universal language of geometry and nature. Um, and David identified the idea of the Garden of Paradise as a key inspiration, a calm oasis in a glade of trees. So this is a glade of trees on the site, and they became the structural trees that join at the top to form the, the geometric canopy roof, and then they're enclosed by CLT walls that are clad in masonry tiles. And we based the whole um, geometry of the building um, on a, um, a pattern that was developed by one of our professors from the AA, Professor Keith Critchlow, who is an expert in sacred Islamic geometry. He joined the team right from the beginning. And he suggested the underlying geometry of the building should be the breadth of the compassionate pattern, which is what this is one of his drawings or two of his drawings, which are based on octagons. We then took that pattern and pulled it up to define the structural trees, going through many, many iterations um, with our in-house in, in three-dimensional modeling capability. And it was at this point we also searched Europe to find the appropriate timber expertise and willingness to rise to the challenge. And Bloomer Lehman um, emerged as the obvious choice. And together we developed the design with them. Um, at, con uh, at come from concept to detailed design. I mean, it was important to bring them in because it was an unusual project and we needed to know that um, it, A, it was po possible to construct it and B, it wasn't going to be ridiculously expensive. Um, and, you know, I can't resist showing this um, image because this is one of their working models and probably one of the most beautiful working models that I've ever seen. And it depicts every different element in a different color and shows all the joints and the fixings. They are true master craftsmen of the 21st century. So this is the, showing the building in its context. It is in Mill Road in Cambridge, which is a kind of very ordinary, if you like, residential area of Cambridge. Um, so we needed to be careful that it didn't dominate its context, that it fitted in. Um, but also somehow stood out because it was a major civic building. So you can see that we took on the geometry of the street um, at the front and then at the back it raises um, with, the, with the, um, the prayer hall to, um, to um, and changes angle to orientate towards Mecca. The material choice for the cladding was inspired by local Cambridge um, gold brick in the area, um, and you can see with red highlights. But we also um, referenced um, Islamic Kufic um, brick design um, and the uh, patterning um, on the mosque reads, say, he is God, the one. Um, and it's, it's a very, um, right from the start, both ourselves and the client were very keen that it was a very um, sustainable mosque. The whole uh, 
pr project was designed so that all the public spaces uh, don't have to have any lighting on during the day. Um, it's entirely naturally ventilated with the ventilation coming at, from a low level out through the roof. Um, it collects the water from the, um, from the roof to uh, flush the toilets and um, water the garden. And um, it has photovoltaics. It, um, and it, from it's, it's obviously it takes the fabric first approach um, with a very highly insulated fabric and using heat pumps and, um, um, and obviously the timber structure as well. So this is um, the project um, looking from the left um, on Mill Road. And there's a kind of sequence of spaces that people take going from the kind of mundane of Mill Road to the kind of sacred space of the prayer hall. And first people go through a community garden, then through an Islamic garden to a portico, then to the atrium, and then into the two different um, ablution spaces that are uh, in blue here to the main prayer hall, which, as I said before, is orientated towards Mecca, with the Qibla wall um, on the um, on the south west side. So this is then shows the um, on the left that's outside with the um, community garden on the outside, and then walking through to the Islamic garden where we have this uh, fountain, um, and then which unfortunately it's not working in that picture. Um, and then through to the portico um, and into the atrium where people gather, um, which has the uh, patterning on the floor, is also the breath of the compassionate pattern. And there you can see the brickwork, you can see the um, um, patterning of God is the one. You can almost make out Allah that turns through um, 90 degrees um, each time. And then this is the view actually looking back from the prayer hall out to the, to the atrium. But you can see you then pass through a kind of lobby space um, into the ablution areas. And um, the ablution area on the left is the women's ablution area and on the right, the men's ablution area, all naturally lit. Uh, and then into the, um, to the main prayer hall. Um, we're standing with our back to the um, Qibla wall here with the mirab and the minbar. Um, and then um, just more views of the um, the prayer hall with the dome that is um, off centre, um, indicating where the Qibla wall is. And there you can see the um, prayer in COVID conditions. Um, and then that is the um, drawing of the the, the um, dome, with the pattern of which was drawn by Keith Critchlow and then we transferred it into um, into three dimensions. Um, so I think maybe we can find an architecture that discovers a new way of embracing global knowledge, 21st te century technology and a connectedness to create local, low carbon, in use and embodied contextual buildings that are unique to their place and somehow um, bring together diverse communities. I always I like to show this because you know you might look at it and think that was um, a Time magazine from last year, but actually it was from 1989. So we've been and this has been a long um, slow burn um, route to where we still aren't where we should be. But I, I like this quote from Polly Higgins, who's responsible for the ecocide movement, where she talks about emergency being a state of emergence. So it's not necessarily something to fear, but a moment in time when we can actually turn things around and I certain, and, and bring something new into being. And I certainly hope that that's the case. So there's no time to you lose. The science is clear. Thank you. I stopped sharing my screen. Great. Good. Well, um, thank you very much, Julia, for uh, that splendid talk, bringing together um, uh, all the issues of COP uh, with your latest building, a uh, very uh, nice journey through uh, the issues of our, our architecture that we face today. Did, did you actually go up to COP yourself? Were you involved in any of the discussions there? or? 
Did no, you? no, I, I didn't. Um, but I, I followed it quite closely from from London. I mean, and it was obviously good that for the first time we had a built environment day. That was obviously good. But it's, um, as I say, it's all happening too slowly. Yes, it's yes. A, and a, and uh, did you feel that uh, depressed at the end or did you think there was that sort of beginning of a shift of attitude from apart from India and China from most of the other nations? Yes, yeah, I, yeah, I know. It's, it, you know, I, I feel one should, we shouldn't be too depressed, but, it, you know, when I, when I saw that carbon tracker um, uh, um, diagram, you know, it just is, it's a very harsh reality and it just shows how far we are from where we need to be. You know, we're on track to go to 2.4, and that's unimaginable. That is unacceptable. And you know, um, you know, I, I just think um, it's good that more people are talking about it, and 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 awareness is raised. But you know, when you think the Today program, you know, did something about it every day while it was COP, and now it, you know, next week, and they're on to something else, and it's almost like it hadn't happened. You know, there's no kind of continuity. I think, you know, it's a problem that is the I think the most important problem, as I said, or the most important issue of our time, and it, and we're nowhere near where we should be. So, um, well, uh, yes, I, but I, I, I was encouraged that you were encouraged by the response from the, um, might say, the built environment sector. At least in 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 the UK, seems to be taking uh, the issue very seriously in terms of what what, what they can do. Um, and as you, I say, think some people are. <laughs> Yes, I mean, there is a huge energy out there from, you know, as I say, mainly from young architects and engineers, um, but it needs to it needs to permeate um, through the whole industry. I mean, I think there's always there's also a lot of developers who are taking it very seriously. You know, I mean, I don't think it's just architects and engineers. who. Are, so I think I think there is hope. Um, it's just that, you know, when you look at those emissions, you know, continuing to go up when we are all we need to be taking a nosedive and uh, halve them by 2030. That, that's, you know, that's where it becomes a bit worrying. <laughs> yes, now I think we, we should try and get some questions from the audience if there's, um, and Josie, who I think is behind the Temple Bar image, um, uh, people should put them in the chat, I think. Is that the idea? Um, yes, um, we don't have any questions on the YouTube, but um, if there will be any questions, I'll put them up on the chat. Okay, fine. I'll I'll look out on uh, uh, for them on, on, on the chat then. Um, good. Um, yes. Yeah, so so uh, if 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 we move to the mosque, because that's that, that. I mean, the whole development. And you mentioned Keith Critchlow, who of course. Um, I mean, at, at the Architecture Association was sketching out uh, uh, images like that back in. Um, Back in the 1970s, I guess, wasn't he really? Well, um, I mean, he was a friend of Buckminster Fuller. You know, he was yeah. uh, he was sketching out geodesic domes, and you know, it's kind of geometry in all of its facets. You know, just uh, so not necessarily just sacred geometry at that time. It was um, it was kind of geometry per se. You know, you kind of have a conversation with him, and you know, within about two seconds, he's talking about the geometry of the universe, and <laughs> you know, he's uh, he was um, incredible. Um, yes, yes. And who, 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 who was your client? I, the, I mean, the, the person you related to who wrote your brief and uh, as, as it were, you, 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 you had to, was it a lot with the local community or is there a hierarchy in these things? That, well, that yes, the client was very interesting, actually. He was, um, he's a professor at the university, up the university. He's um He's um, a convert, um, and his father, who you maybe knew, um, was John Winter. So his name is Tim Winter. Right. So, Gosh. yeah. So, so it was a it was a very interesting client because he obviously he he kind of has comes from an architectural kind of heritage, and he wanted a piece of architecture. He, you know, recognised that a lot of the mosques in this country are. Um, you know, very pastiche and wanted um, a unique building for Cambridge because obviously um, I think Oxford has a number of mosques, but Cambridge didn't have one. Um, so the fact that he was a, um, you know, had this kind of cultural bridge between um, 
you know, the West and um, Islam, I think was very uh, important, really, in um, being able to achieve what we did achieve. You know, he almost is the personification of that cultural bridge between the, the two um, the two cultures. Um, and and, and uh, how, how, how did you relate to the um, congregation? Is that the right way to uh, describe it? Um, I mean, the, the local community and uh, the people who use it? I mean, did, uh, yes, uh, well, well kind of... I mean, obviously, you know, Tim was a, was a very intelligent man. He, he actually involved the local non-Muslim community as well as the Muslim community from the beginning. So, um, you know, the local community groups were actually involved in the competition stage because it was a competition. Um, and, um, you know, the uh, the local Muslim community as well. I mean, you know, we, we met um, people from um, the Muslim community all the way through the process. Um, for example, we had um, discussions with um, Muslim women um, about what they um, wanted in the mosque and there was um, actually the Muslim Academic Trust who were the client um, reached out to um, the Muslim community asking what kind of spaces they wanted and and in response we created um, a series of spaces for, for women um, and um, you know people coming from more traditional backgrounds you know straight into the UK might want to be separate but we've also we made sure that they were part of the same in one space and there is a matter of your screen um, but it's quite low and it's got a gap in it so you know I'm hoping that in the fullness of time it might um, you know it's movable and and removable <laughs> yeah, yeah. maybe I'm a bit too optimistic about that um, and you, you, you talked about long life. Um, um, how, how, how do you see, uh, I mean, other building types, I guess large scale spaces like mosques are, are pretty flexible in, in their use, but uh, I might say tighter building types. Um, uh, you know, Alec Gordon talked about long life, loose fit. Uh, yes. Do you think long life, loose fit or long life, take it apart and rebuild it? Or what, 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 what is this? Or all of the above. Yes, I think I all, think of, all the of the above. above. Really. really, I mean, I, you know, it's 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 um, you know we need to use less material. You know, we need to, as uh, Baker Brown suggests, you know, mine the Anthropocene uh, take. take. Yeah. So it's actually reusing um, materials that already exist. So you know, we need to demolish less. Um, in fact, we need to not demolish if possible. I mean, I think there's got to be a very, very good reason to demolish a building rather than refurbishing it. Um, you know, because the um, the kind of carbon cost is huge. Um, so, I mean, that would be the first thing. Um, but obviously we also need to, you know, build buildings that can be repurposed um, and um, maybe deconstructed um, as I said, we need to stop using glue, for example. <laughs> we yeah. need to stop using um, cement mortar, um, you know, so that, um, you know, if you use lime mortar, obviously you can take you can take it apart much more easily. I mean, the reason why that um, project in Copenhagen, you know, they had to kind of literally carve the bits of wall out and reuse them as is because you couldn't take them apart. You couldn't take each brick apart and reuse it. Um, like that. So all of, all of these things, um, we, but we need to do it quickly. I mean, the next, well, it was 12 years in, in 2008. So I think we're at about eight years. <laughs> the next eight years are critical. Um, and, um, you yeah. know, I think but, it's... <laughs> but it's the critical things that make people um, take notice, isn't it, really? I think that the... Um, uh, you know, the fires and the floods are the things which have changed attitudes because they have impacted on people who may be skeptical. Um, I, what really worries me is whether, whether in fact, uh, Donald Trump has uh, taken that on board as well, because you know there's always a chance he might get back in again. And that, that, I would, know. Be, uh, that would actually be, I mean, it's a disaster for the world, wouldn't it? I think. It, 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 it would it, indeed. Yes, I was listening to a podcast about that the other day, where he's, you know, they're saying he's preparing. <laughs> Yeah, and that's yeah. scary. And, 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 yes, um, yes. yes, so. But, I don't but obviously, we need to. 
you know, I, 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 you know, I don't have or I don't have the answers really. Um, it's just, you know, I think we just need to talk about it, you know, as much as possible. And I think people need to, you know, uh, you know, make their voices heard to the government because I think if governments realize, you know, knew that people were um, putting pressure on, I think they would change. I mean, particularly in democracies. Obviously, not, you know, if you're in a in a dictatorship, that's a different thing. But in democracies, I think. They do. Um, they do listen, and I don't think enough people are um, making their voices heard at the moment. Yes, but I, th I, I mean, I think the, the the period when you set up um, architects declare and the other things which were going on at the time and the the the, 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 the student strikes and so on that that that, that was a, a period when there seemed to be a, a major shift in opinion and actually although although people. Um, uh, are slightly critical, saying, you know, are they having the right impact? I think Extinction Rebellion were actually very, it had a big impact. Uh, the, the pink boat in Oxford Circus. Yeah, it, yeah. It did it, it really change a, a, a lot of opinions, maybe maybe not car drivers who were stuck, but uh, everybody else yeah. had a very positive reaction to that. And, and it did seem there were. Yes, there yeah, were, right. I mean, I, 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 think, I think Extinction Rebellion were. Were, were brilliant. I mean, you know, I'm a I'm a great supporter of um, of Extinction Rebellion. I think they they did have a positive impact, and obviously the youth strikers as well. Um, but we just need to continue talking about it. And I think um, you know the mainstream media it doesn't talk about it enough. They you know now that cops over, I just I wonder whether they have just kind of turn around and just do business as usual. Um, and and we really mustn't. Um, when you think about um, you know, in you know, insulate Britain. I mean, they're a kind of offshoot of um, yes. um, Extinction Rebellion, and um, you know, we're in a situation where nine ordinary people who just you know were prepared to stand up and be counted are now facing jail. I mean, it's it's just it's it's ridiculous. Um, you know, just because they 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 disrupted people for a very short period of time well the disruption that's coming along down the line with the yeah. you know 2.4 degrees is is nothing like um what that disruption involves you know that they're, they're just trying to make their voices heard i mean i always think that you know if someone woke you in the middle of the night to tell you that your house was on fire uh, you you might be cross for a couple of minutes but actually you might be grateful as well and i think that analogy is 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 one that fit, fits in with uh, insulate britain because i think the government should be taking much more of a radical um approach to um to the need to insulate britain's homes you know 29 million homes um we have that we have the leakiest homes in europe um and um you need you know with um we need to retrofit them, and we need to retrofit them fast, because um, you know the the um, you know the energy need. I mean, for a number of reasons, it's going to lower the energy need. <laughs> it's going to take a lot of people out of fuel poverty, and it's going to um, be good for the planet. I mean, and and it could create jobs. Um, but the the government needs to take a lead and do it as an infrastructure project. I, Personally, I think. Um, so, so how, but how, how, how do you think they do do that? I mean, shouldn't we as an industry be maybe giving them more guidance as how this can be delivered? Because yes, you yes. Know, there, were, there were a lot of um, uh, proposals, you know, people who said, you know, what are the 10 things we should be doing? A lot of lists um, that came out of COP said, number one is um, fabric first, insulate homes. Yes, uh, yes, yes, that. exactly. But, and, but the government has, you know, it's tried rather half-heartedly, put a bit of funding in two or three times and failed miserably. But, you know, the, the complexities of doing one house at a time is huge, isn't it? particularly in terraces and so on. So, I mean, how, yes, no, how, it, it, how, it, it, I mean it, it, shouldn't it, we be saying, you know, here, here, here's a solution for this sort of uh, house um, uh, and we can deliver it and be, this is how you create yes. a, um, yeah, so well, I, I think we can. I mean, I don't know if you've seen Letty's recent um, retrofit guide. Yeah. Um, I mean, that does just that. I mean, it's basic, it's all there, you know, all 120 pages of whatever yeah. it is. It's a, it's a really, really substantial 
piece of work um, that does just that. Um, I mean, I think the industry is ready, and you're right; it's highly complex because that you know virtually every house is different, um, and we would have to recruit a whole kind of army of new. Um, uh, builders, I think, um, that would have to be specially trained. Um, but if, you know, it, it has to be something like the Roosevelt um, Green Deal, you know, the, like yeah. the, 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 the core, the um, country core that the, the Roosevelt, that that's what it's going to have to be like, um, something like that in order to get it done. Um, I think that's, that's true, but maybe, I mean, I can remember when I first bought a house a long time ago, the government had a thing called um, housing improvement grants, I think. And, and, it did, uh, yes. I uh, remember those. Because there were a lot of houses in the country then that didn't have internal lavatories, for instance. And, yeah. uh, you know, they, they, they gave the money. It seemed to work very well. It was, it was uh, money was doled out by local authorities. And I think that's actually one of the answers. Not, not, it shouldn't come from MHC. Or yes, no, no, you're absolutely right. I agree with that, yeah. But the local authorities need to be given the money to do it, don't they? They do. Um, they do. Yes. yes. And yes. you know, I, I, this yeah, you know, there's apparently you can get five thousand pounds for a um, heat pump from the government. That's their kind of le latest um, kind of delving into this um, situation. But you know, one of one of my architects in 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 Marks Barfield tried to get hold of one and get hold of that five thousand. And of course, you know, they were completely that they. they they weren't allowed to because they were earning too much money. But well, they don't earn that much money. But um, you know, so it's very, very restricted. It's not. Um, it's not done in a kind of serious way. I don't think. Yes. Yes. No. More mm. needs to be done. Well, um, we we don't seem to have any questions in in the chat. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I, I mean, I'll um, really let, let let you go back to um, uh, your. Um, or uh, have supper, I suppose, now, isn't it, rather back to the office? No, no, we're, we're uh, working on a competition at the moment, so... <laughs> oh, very good. So uh, uh, well, we, we'll yeah. let you get back to the, the, the competition, and good luck with the competition. But uh, okay. thank, thank you very much for your presentation. It's really, as I say, great to tie those those things uh, together and see some of uh, your work, and bad luck with the Sterling Prize, but it, uh, it's very good that it got into the shortlist. Anyway, yeah. that's always a good thing too, isn't it? Even yeah, it is a good thing. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much indeed. And thank you everybody for um, uh, coming or watching. And uh, we hope to be able to open the doors of Temple Bar to you very soon.